Hello and welcome this week to Talking Flutes Extra with me, Jean-Paul Wright. As usual, a huge shout out to our wonderful podcast sponsors, TJ Flutes, who continue to support Claire and I with these weekly pods. You can follow them on socials at TJ Flutes and also via the web on tjflutes.com. When we asked for ideas about future guests at the back end of last year, one of the suggestions particularly stood out as it wasn't about inviting a certain flute player on. Amy Kilcane from Texas, who is a doubling musician, this is somebody that plays the flute along with other instruments, and in this case, Amy plays clarinet and saxophone, suggested that we have a look outside of the flute world and see what we can learn from cool musicians who don't necessarily play the flute. She goes on in her mail to say that I have learned so much from other sax players and sax teachers that I believe that we as flute players shouldn't be confined to influences and styles only from our own little world. Do you know, I couldn't agree more, Amy. So a couple of weeks ago, I interrupted his very busy schedule to record today's interview with a very special and brilliant New York-based musician. In the 20 plus years he toured the world with Paul Simon, Andy Snitzer not only provided the band's powerhouse horn muscle, but got a premier nightly view of the master's perfectionism in action. If there were eight bars in his arrangement that didn't thrill him, he would work until those eight bars were something magical. His goal was constantly, relentlessly, keeping his arrangements interesting, dynamic, making every note matter. Throughout his multifaceted career, which also includes touring with Billy Joel, joining the Rolling Stones on the famed Voodoo Lounge and Bridges to Babylon tours, Andy Snitzer has learned the fine art and necessity of building a team with optimal collaborators. A remarkable 26 years after the release of his debut album, Ties That Bind, Andy Snitzer is equally passionate and unsatisfiable as a solo artist, infusing every nuance with the purpose as a player, writer, producer, arranger and curator. So I began the podcast by asking Andy, where did the initial musical seed come from? And how did you water it over the years for growing into the Andy Snitzer we have here today? So I don't know if there was an initial seed, but as a, as a kid, right, when you, when you start coming online as a human being and you, if you're interested in music and you become aware of music, uh, you're, you're feeling all these different inputs. And, and uh, even uh, before you're 10, you're having casual responses to what you like and what you don't like, right? That's everybody's truth. So I, I would guess I would say this. I never let anyone tell me what I shouldn't like and what wasn't cool, and what I shouldn't listen to, that sort of thing, right? I was always willing to like what I liked. And that's really the story, because when I, by the time I got to university, here I was, a guy that liked John Coltrane, and Michael Brecker, and David Sanborn, and Led Zeppelin, and Jimi Hendrix, and Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Queen, right? And lots of different pop music, and, and that was me. And uh, I was somewhat of an outlier, in that way, because uh, at that point, and I think it continues to that day, many kids that became interested in jazz improvisation eschewed pop music, right? They, they weren't interested in that, so or, or were told not to be interested in it, but probably just weren't interested in it. So here I am, this kind of quirky bird, right? And I never let anyone talk me out of it. I never let anyone tell me that, that I couldn't do this or that or like this or that or listen to this or that. And so those inputs made me, they enabled me to fashion a sound and a style based on my influences that sounds right in rock and pop. So sure, I can play jazz. Sure, I can improvise. If you give me giant steps, I'll, I'll play choruses over it. If you give me a standard tune, I'll play the two five ones and play lots of fancy stuff over it, right? But that's not what the world identifies me as the import of me. Right, the importance of me, the, the power of me is in this intersection of jazz and rock and pop. 
So it all came, the initial seed is being willing to like what you like, no matter what it is, right? So uh, that, that I think that's the answer to that. Don't let anyone tell you what not to like or what not to do. And your seed comes from that. God, what a fantastic mantra that is. And okay. such, such, cool. you must have been such a strong person at a young age to not be, to in, be influenced to move along one certain line with all your buddies. You know, it, I was kind of a polite and I don't want to say shy, but I wasn't like, like this sort of like giant personality, like, like spewing this from the rooftop. It's just kind of what I did. You know, it's just kind of what I did and how I acted and how I pursued my study. Meaning, sure, I love Charlie Parker. I checked it out, right? And I transcribed some solos and I, and I studied the Omni book, right? But I knew that wasn't my truth. That wasn't where I was headed to be a neoclassicist, right? So I didn't spend as much time on that as some other people did, right? And an observer of that might have said, oh, well, this young man is not serious about his study. When, when in fact, I'm just making choices, right, about where I'm going to allocate my time, about what's really resonating with me. Again, a really important message and vibe to any musician out there is just find out what's important to you and you make those choices rather than others make the choices for you. Right. So, I mean, this dovetails into another question on the list, but when people say, well, how did you get that style? How did you get that mm. identifiable sound? And it's the same kind of answer, right? Like, if I'm, if I'm in my early 20s to late teens and I'm playing in a rock band or I'm, I'm playing in, in some sort of electric ensemble, what I'm thinking is, I don't fit here, right? I, I, need, I need, my sound isn't right. I need, to, I need to change it, right? I don't, my inflection set, I, the, it's, not, it doesn't, it's not resonating. It doesn't feel right, right? So being willing to take yourself to task in those ways and respond, not get a mouth, change your mouthpiece or anything like that. Just kind of like, Will it to be your brain, your psyche, your body, your instrument, find a way to make a sound that fits better, right? Find a way to get to play ideas and, and nuances and, and uh, inflection sets that fit better in the music that you're playing. And so you're being your own self-critic, aren't you, in that situation? Like crazy. And that, that's the other thing, right? So if you're gonna if you're gonna improvise, right, you're gonna wade into these waters. Um, you, you, on the one hand, have to be sort of like sturdy and bulletproof. And on the other hand, you have to be relentless in your self-critique. And that, that's, that's the only way you're going to push through and, and find something that's actually yours, right? A little, a little slice of this that's yours. And when you find it, do you know you found it? So when you're listening and critiquing your sound and, you, the, as you say, the, the influences and the little added bits that you're, you're adding into the notes, do you know straight away you've got it? Or are you still searching? Well, no, I mean, even to this day when I, when I record, like I'm, I'm right in the middle of a new record now, and, and I can do this when I, when I play, right, and I listen back to what I've recorded, at this point, I instantly know if I like that or I don't like that. I, I have to play that phrase again. I have to keep working on it. There's something about the nuance, right? Something about the way I've, I've, I've done a little thing or tossed off a note or wh whatever it is, right? I have perfect, at, at this point, I have perfect radar on what is right for me, what resonates with me, for me. That, that took a while, right? But at the same time, people will say to me, I heard you when you were still in your 20s, and even then, you had your sound. You had your style. So that, that, that's a bit of luck and also part of the, the way I was going at it, right? You take these influences, listen to no one, and please yourself, right? Attempt to please yourself and be, and be critical, be hypercritical, right? Like, it's your voice when I play the saxophone and I improvise, when I play a melody, right? It's... It's my voice, which I, I've been working on for decades now, right? So it's, it's different than, um, I think, because I've only done this, I haven't done the other. It's different than becoming a very, very high-level orchestral player, right? Where it's, it's not about the individuality. It's not about your personal voice in terms of inflections, right? Or things you do with notes, right? It's, it's, and you'll tell me more about this, but... Um, it, it, 
it's it's about and not that it's not that it's only about uh, imitation and mechanics in, 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 in an already a delineated style, right? But but it's it's not about those things. I don't think, right? So the improvising thing is one hundred percent about that. Like, what is your true voice when you play and and you express, right? Are you connecting with your true elemental output as if you were singing into the room, even if you're not a singer, right? The way you would sing a line, the way you would sing a melody or phrase it, right? Are you getting that out of your instrument in a powerful way? So it's, it's, it's easy for me to ramble, so rope me in. So you're in the middle of writing a new album. You, yeah. You're obviously here in your, my, in your mind's eye or mind's ear, the line that you're wanting to play. When you get into the studio and you play it, and then you listen to it back and you say, you know immediately that there's a nuance that isn't there or is there that shouldn't be there. Right. When right. you go back and re-record, that moment in time is that moment in time, isn't it? So are you the perfectionist that will listen to it and say, mm, or, yeah, okay, where's the point that you let go and say, yeah, that track's done? So, so I'll sit here, right? And, and at this point, it, it doesn't take days and days of, re, of coming back to it, right? I'll, you know, I've got the track worked out. And I'm coming to play the saxophone for the first time on it. I've got the idea of the melody in my head, and I start to play it. And sort of on a very elemental level, I'll immediately say, oh, yeah, I like, I like the melody, but, but that's, you know, that first recording, that's not it. I don't say to myself, well, it needs to be this, or it needs to be that, or it needs to be the other thing, right? I just say no, and then I keep, and then I play it again, and my mind and my body, right, and everything about me physically and emotionally and mentally makes it happen, points me in the right direction, and then maybe two or three or four passes later, I'm starting to get very close to something that just pleases me when I listen to it. Do you know what I mean? I so, do. You're not conf you're not confined by construct, which is that the physical note, because you you just go back in and you've got the freedom, both mentally and physically, to do it again. And your vo yeah. your voice would be very different, wouldn't it? Yes. And and so the the main thing is like I'm I'm going to record it. I'm going to do it again until when I hit that space bar and it plays back. So it's me now as listener, right? Not as player not as engineer, not as producer, not as author of the song, composer of the song. Me as a listener, like I was when I was 14, right? Is, does that move me, right? Does that, does that feel good? Does that do something for me or does it not do something for me? And if it doesn't, whether, even if it's perfectly in tune and in time and blah, 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 if, it, if it's not doing something for me, it's not moving me, back we go. It's kind of like that. I spent all this time coming to understand what my voice means, what it feels like. And after all that time, I have very good ability to know when I've done that or not. But it took a long time, right? It took a long time to get to this point. So to, to fall back, if you're interested in this, just right away, right? Start considering the idea that this is your voice, even if you're a beginning improviser. You immediately, you have to start thinking about your expression, right? Not the expression and vocabulary of your heroes, which you're going to imitate and learn in your journey, right? But the end game is your expression. Does that make sense? The end game yeah. is not, the end game is not to be the most unbelievable imitator of Mike Brecker that the earth has. It's not, right? That's amazing. But that's not an that's not an end game, right? That's not that's not a true artistic search because he was already here, he already did that. You you have to find whatever it is that's yours. It won't be as powerful as Mike Brecker. It won't be, you know. <laughs> but 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 it will be yours, right? And in other ways, in smaller ways, it, it can be very powerful and maybe just as powerful for a, a certain listener. And that's what I've also come to understand is that, you know, I'll never see myself as anything compared to that guy, to Mike, for instance, right? I do understand that by this pursuit, right, of my individuality and my voice, I've actually been able to reach people as me, as a player, improviser, and composer, and those people may not be aware of Mike Brecker, may not care, or whatever, or, or maybe they're saxophone players and they are aware of all that, but they still, they come to me and they say, you're the guy. 
when I hear you, I hear all the things that I like. It's, it's a much smaller number than the people that say that about Mike Brecker, but that's my end game, right? That's my journey. Start right away. Start right away thinking about is considering the idea that this is your expression, no one else's. Anyway. What I'm really keen and what's really powerfully coming over, Andy, is, and I don't think flute players, I know we're talking flute players now, don't necessarily look to create their own voice. They go along this very set route that is built right. around what their teachers have, have learned to teach, and it's very structured and you play the Mozarts, the Bach, and then you may play some contemporary music. But very rarely do you get the opportunity or have that burning desire to actually find your own voice. As you said earlier, the trouble with that is you then potentially become a clone or you just get lost in the fog of these hundreds of thousands of flute players. The importance of creating well, no, not creating, or finding your voice is probably the most important thing as a musician. And you've sort of demonstrated already that everything that you've grown up about is unlocking your voice, finding it and right. unlocking it. Right. right. And you'll tell me, have, uh, given what you've said, I'm going to, I'll guess that the greatest flute, the, those regarded as the most important flute players in history, right, are identifiable. Yes. Immediately. <laughs> yes. Even, even within that realm of classical music where you're not improvising, you're playing repertoire, you're playing parts. The people that are regarded as the highest people ever, yeah. right? They have somehow they have their voice. They do. And that's part of why they're regarded so highly. Yeah. Right. And even if they had all that technical expertise and, and, and blazing virtuosity, without that other thing that somehow makes them them, their sound, something about their style, something about the way they do things that, that people go, boom, right? You don't get to be in that league of greats, right, without having that as part of you. So, sure, classical flute players, the expression idea and then the improvising idea are kind of like separate separate things, you know, heading to the same destination where we're kind of talking about two things at once. I mean, Attempting to improvise for people that don't improvise, that have only played parts, right? Just allowing yourself the freedom to pick up your instrument and just play some notes, right? Just play, just make a melody, just mess around. Probably won't get to all these questions, but we're going through some of them as we speak. And we're talking about, you know, how do you improvise and how do you approach that? And what is that? The first thing is, if you're not an improviser, get comfortable with the idea of just picking up your instrument and playing it. Not, you're not reading music. You're not reading a part. You just pick it up and you play. Loosen up to that. Get familiar with that, with that feeling, with that concept. Then when you talk about actual improvising, I mean, particularly in jazz, where, where the harmony is more challenging, as the, as the harmony gets more and more challenging, you have to know more about chords and scales, right, and how to voice lead through changes. And that, that, that's all very complicated in a way. Right, it, it takes years to get comfortable with, but but most people don't even get comfortable with the first part, which is just play your instrument, pick it up and play it, you know, and and be comfortable doing that. Just pick it up and play it. What's interesting, Alex, is, if, is we've been as flute players, we've been spoon fed the blobs on stick written on a piece of parchment, and then when we get to a place where when we see jazz music and it's just got a an empty bar with a a line in it, and you think, gosh. And it's just got a chord over the top. Oh, right. my word. That's it. Bam, 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 bam. It's, ah. <laughs> right. Well, I'm saying, like, e even before you've approached any, the idea of harmony or the idea of vocabulary or the idea of, of listening to people that you like, was up, which is a whole other big yeah. part of it, even before any of that, can you pick your instrument up, play along with a backing track and, and allow yourself, right, to do that and sound awkward and feel awkward? and feel encumbered and, and do that every day or a couple of days and press against that, right? So you can start to feel more comfortable with the notion of it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because all the chords and scales in the world, they won't mean anything until you've given yourself permission to start being free. Permission, you've given yourself permission to, to have that freedom. To not read a part. One question here is when you are performing a very well-known sax riff on a gig. That's a good question. Yeah. 
Can you really make it yours? Or are you a prisoner of how people know it? Well, you, you have to make it yours, right, in, in some way. The question is, do you decide to do that in a, in a more substantial way or do you do it in a, a lesser way? And this is delicate because what I'm going to say is it really comes back to how seminal and classic and important is the thing that you're playing. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I'm not going to, so we won't give examples. Or, okay. So, so for instance, if I come, like, I'll just say this, if I, if I, Mike Brecker again, my, my, you know, my idol, yeah. if, I, if I come to the still crazy solo, which I played with Paul Simon for many, many years, I'm going to start that solo the same way he started it. Right. And, mm-hmm. and really the, the overview of it is going to be the same as he did. What I had to do was, necessarily, and there wasn't even a choice, is find a way to speak my voice in that context. So it's a melody that it's very familiar, and, and the phrases, audiences, everybody would find it odd if you started in some totally different way, right? But the inflection set and the sound and the emotional approach, right? Like Mike Singh was, very, was really very stately on that moment. If you see the 91 tour, with the big band from guys from Africa and Brazil and the United States, it's almost like pop orchestral. And his presentation is, is powerful, but it's very stately. When I came in, the band had changed. There was a guy playing guitar who was more like, like I mean, an amazing musician, but he had rock guitar in his background, right? The thing kind of moved a little bit. It rocked out a little harder. And that was, that was perfect for me and a function of me being there, right? So if you listen to my version, it's much more like rock it's much more it's much more like visceral in that way it's not as stately and that fit me it fit the way the band was moving but it was necessary i couldn't do a proper version of mike doing his thing right it would just sound like me imitating him so that's one part of it the next part of it is if it's a a moment or a riff or a line or a solo section this is a thing that's happened to me right i'm not going to give it the example but I'll, 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 be, I'll be playing a solo section on a very, very famous song where the solo wasn't seminal, right? Wasn't super important and legendary. And in those occasions, I've taken the opportunity to do my own thing, right? And kind of like compose something. I don't go in any of those moments, like those pop music moments. They're not, they're not jazz moments. So I'm not improvising, right? Like I've, I've basically, in my practice, I've written something that I really like. Right. And it'll have little nuanced differences and little little moments of difference from night to night. But but, you know, I'll I'll take that liberty if I feel like the solo in that very, very famous song isn't as famous and recognizable and important as the Mike Brecker example. So that's that's the answer. Most of the time. Right. I end up playing the solo that's on the record. Because most of the time, they're very important and seminal. Like, if I'm going to play the Phil Woods solo, uh, Just the Way You Are from Billy Joel, of course I'm going to play that solo, right? Yeah. It's the same thing. It's, 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 it's perfectly melodic and, 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 and amazing, and, and it's part of the composition to the ear of, of, of every listener, I'm going to say. 99% of listeners know that song. To do otherwise, people would go, what, what, what have you done? You know, you're, you're, you're playing a different song or something like that, right? So... Most of the time, uh, it's a long answer to a short question. Most of the time, I'm going to stay in lane and and do my version of what's been articulated. But sometimes I'll do my own thing. And I'm just going to make that call case by case. So well, I was going to reference the Phil Wood solo um, because I, yeah. when, when you're on tour with Billy Joel, such a, such a famous solo. But you made it yours. You made it yeah. yours. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 so it, it, by definition, it's going to have a little bit more of a modern, Thing in the sound, it's going to have a little bit of you know more more of a, just not even in the inflection set, but in, in just in the tone, yeah. the mouthpiece, yeah. the, the, you know, they'll have a little bit of a, a David Sanborn influence thing because yeah. I'm doing it right. But but again, the, the way it starts, the melodies, right, the, the, the basic articulation of, of the ideas is so important and, and so beautiful and classic. You have to play. It. It'll always be slightly different because I'm doing it right. And because I approach things that way, like I approach things as 
I'm playing this moment in this Billy Joel song. It's a fill with solo, but I have to have to, I have to get my voice in there, right, to feel right and comfortable and powerful. So I have to, in some little way, get my sound, my vibe in there. But mostly, I want to pay respect to this important thing. How do the artists react when somebody like you comes in and takes over a really big number like that for the first time? It must be quite hard because they're so used to hearing it. <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, I think I think most of the time, like Paul, very artistic and very brilliant and very opinionated, right? All in good ways. He he's also he's very wise. Like he never came to me. So when I first started, right, like the first rehearsal, the first day I played that solo, I'm still in process. And I was also younger when I started with Paul. I was in my late thirties, right? So I I I, I wasn't as you know, formed like bulletproof in those ways, right? I didn't, I didn't have the same kind of like just, you know, straight confidence in these ways. But so in those first days of rehearsal, I probably didn't sound fully comfortable and fully powerful, the full good version of what it would become. And he never said anything. He never said a word. Because I think, I think he knew that that was the process that was unfolding, right? And he knew that Mike Brecker had said, this is the guy you should get. That was very wise. And within a certain period of time, I came to my view of it, right? But to answer your, your, your general question, you know, there was one night on, on, the, on the Rolling Stones, I didn't play the solos. Bobby Keys was still there, but there was one night that, that he got sick or something. He couldn't go up on stage. So they, they, Mick Jagger came to me. They all kind of came around in a very worried way. Like, are you going to be okay? Can you do this? <laughs> Can you play this solo? Right? And, uh, and I said, yeah, it's going it, to, no problem. It's, it's no problem. It's going to be fine. And, uh, and then I did it and after, no one said anything after I did it. Right. Like, cause I know it was cool. Like I knew the solo and I, and I, I fashioned some of Bobby's sound. I couldn't, I'm not going to get that, you know, loud as, as an airplane Texas tenor thing, like the equipment that he used and the way he did it. It's, it's a different sound, but I, you know, again, I, I have a, a background in rock and roll, so I could fashion a sound and inflection set that sounded right for that music. And uh, yeah, I, I think, I think, no, I think Charlie Watts might have come to me afterwards and said, you know, well done or something like that. You know, some, some little British phrase, <laughs> of the sort, a little, little, uh, you know, pat on the back after I did it. But yeah, it's, it, I, I guess the answer is, you know, I've never had a problem and no one's ever, no one's really ever come over and gone like, oh my God, you've reinvented the wheel, you know, like, <laughs> which I wouldn't expect them to. But, but uh, I, think, I think generally with, with those sorts of folks, hearing nothing is good. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like getting no feedback is the equivalent of good feedback. Yeah, <laughs> I totally get that. And on the same vein, another one of the questions that I was sending was, building solos that are cohesive and have direction yeah. because yeah. That, that's important to anybody that is that is getting this line where they have really they're in the front of the stage and that direction and the cohesive right. nature of where they where they're taking it because you don't want the sat right. nav to take you forward and then all the way back again do you right so th this this is a question that goes to the fundamental of improvising you know, fun, fundamental ideas and the answer is so luckily, I always had, I was, I was given a melodic sense. Not, I certainly honed it and made it better and grew it, right? I always, from the, from the moments I was improvising, I, I always had the ability to kind of like make a statement, make a melodic statement, make a phrase statement, develop it, right? Just kind of keep, keep composing, really, right, on the spot as, as you're improvising. And to a certain extent, that was a, just a talent given, right? To another extent, it's back to that thing of the, the elemental expression. So I remember before I played the saxophone well at all, I remember being in my room and listening to some like David Bowie or, or some other uh, English rock band, right? And I remember this woman. I see myself at 14 or something like that in my room singing, right, against this track, singing blues licks, like to improvising out of my mouth and thinking to myself, I can do this. That sounds good. I can't really play it yet. You know, I can't, I can't, and I can't make a sound on the saxophone that makes that pleasing yet. But 
when I'm just singing and, and my mind is responding to this music, I can do this. And that was, that was kind of an important moment, right? And, and again, I'm allowing myself to just, and I would recommend this to people that want to improvise in terms of just, you know, picking up your instrument and just playing it. Another thing is put on some music and just start singing. See if you can improvise. See if you can say, like, sing some phrases, some bluesy phrases, right? Like everyone's got the blues in their ear. You don't need, you don't need a, to know a bunch about chords and scales to do that. Everyone's got the blues in their ear. Everybody. So see if you can play some music and start singing some stuff that seems relevant. And and okay. And then can you develop, right? Can you can you sing a little idea over this track and, and keep building it and turning it into something? And that's kind of like the nascent process of of being able to build a coherent solo, right? When you're on stage and you're improvising. It's a good question and I'd recommend that, right? Like if you've never, if you've never expressed, let alone played, if you've never even expressed in these ways, start expressing, put on some music, make sure no one can hear you and, uh, and start singing. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, cause it, whatever, if you're self-conscious, I certainly was, right? Just start singing and, and see what kind of ideas come out of you. I've been lucky enough to know you for many years, Andy, and you've always laughed at the fact that I've always told you I can't improvise, and you've basically said bullshit. Everyone can improvise. Well, cause, right, because you haven't. That's why you can't, because <laughs> you've not tried. <laughs> yeah, but you, you've, you've just hit it on. As you were talking, I was bluesing it in over yeah. a song in my head. I thought, yeah, you've actually got it. I don't have to play it first. I can just get the, almost get the patterns and the vibe. You shouldn't play it first because that, that like the, the most elemental expression of it is you and your voice. And even in your mind, you don't even have to see it. You just, you just to hear it or hum it, right? You put the instrument in the way before you're ready with that. And, and now you've got like, you've got several barriers all lined up at the same time. I'm looking forward to hearing you improvise now. That we've that <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start singing as soon as we um, finish this podcast. Get off the call. All right. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll get some Bowie out. That'd be interesting. Cause that's one yeah. that's, that's quite hard to improvise over, actually, yeah. isn't it? Well, you know, I don't remember what it was, but Suffragette City era, yeah. something bluesy, right? Yeah. Like, like all the young dudes. Like there's so many examples where you can do that or, or put on blues and then sing some blues, right? <laughs> I think you've cracked it. You know, I've, I'm, I've turned into an old geezer, not been able to do it, but I think that one little phrase you've just put there about singing it, why, why didn't I think about that years ago? Gosh, the simplicity. Yeah. I think the reason that that memory of mine that, I, that, you know, you have those memories where you see you see yourself in place. They're photographs almost, right, of the moment and the place and where you were and what was happening. I have that about, about thinking to myself, I can do this, right? I, I, can, I can do this. I can make up phrases and what I'm hearing and the ideas that I'm singing, they sound cool against this. Like, I'm actually, I actually can do this. That was the moment where I said, where I knew that I could do this. Anyway. Hey, hey, I'm quite pumped about this, actually. Good. Excellent. <laughs> Andy, you're a multifaceted person. You didn't go straight into the music business. You're such a clever person. You did your MBA and went into what we would call the city, but you went into sort of finance, didn't you? The big world yeah, well, of finance. Look, look, I mean, it, it's basically, uh, you know, I had my father was an attorney, right? Mm -hmm. So you had to come from a, a family with, a, with some kind of a, you know, professional class background, right, of that sort. And that, that was negotiating my way into being able to try to do this, yeah. which was complicated. And, and I was good at school, right? So it, that, that route wouldn't be for everybody, but I, I was lined up to do that, right? Like I, I could do that work. I must say, I mean, getting an MBA was, was, was hard work, but I was, I was, I was in terms of the math and, and all that kind of stuff, I was set up to do it. So it, it was, it was a hedge, right? It was, it was a fail safe. And I've come to understand that that's also anything like that is person dependent. Like meaning I was meant to have that, I was meant to be that guy that had a fail safe that was able to do it. There's lots of people that aren't meant to be that person. There's lots of people that are meant to quit college and jump off the cliff. Yeah. Right. They're meant, and they do it. And some of those, and, and some of those people become extremely successful, right. With, within the music business, they weren't meant to get an MBA. Right. They weren't meant. I look at them and go, you did three and a half of years, three, you did three and a half years of college and then you left. 
right? You're literally, you're like four months from finishing the thing and getting the piece of paper and, and you just pulled up, right? And blew it all off. In my mind, that's insane. Like I, that's, I would never in a million years do that, right? But another person, somehow they're meant to do that and it works. How would you recommend those that are looking down a different route to take the chance, to create the chance, to create the opportunity, to go after it rather than sort of moan about not getting the breaks? I mean, it's different now than it was X decades ago, right? Because we didn't, there was no internet, but I'd still, there's one basic thesis, which I think is the same. You do this as young as you can possibly do it, right? At some point, life intervenes and you're not going to move to New York and pursue your dream, right? You, you, you can't because you've got a family, right? Or, or there's just too many things now in terms of life that are in your way. So as young as you can do it, go to the center of these things. Go to a place where people are coming from all around the world to compete, to try to be part of this. New York, LA, Nashville, I think London is probably one also, right? I wouldn't be expert on where those places are in the world now, but of course, New York will always be one, right? So if you want to try to be part of something like this in some way, as soon as you can, figure out how to go to that place and do whatever you have to do to be there, right? The caveat to that is, there's another thing that you also have to do as young as you can do it. And that is practice like a madman, mm. right? Yeah. And hold yourself to task. And and so this advice is really only for young people. This is sort of doesn't even apply to anybody that's that's into adult life. But but it's my true answer. You want to try to be very good as a young person. You want to have done serious study uh, on your instrument, and and then you want to go to a place where people are coming, like I said, coming from around the world to compete and do this because. You will, you will meet all sorts of other young people like yourselves, right? You will have a commonality. You will become friends with them. You will hang out with them. You will go and play. You'll go to jam sessions. And you, if you're powerful and those other people are powerful as young people, you will start to do things, right, collectively, right? You'll get, you'll get a break, something. And then you'll say to that where your break is, you'll say, hey, because everyone's always looking for young talent, right? They're looking for things that are new and young talent is inexpensive, right? Mm -hmm. when, when it's young. So everyone's always looking for that. So go to a place like that. You'll get a break. Another person will get a break and you kind of all move up together. That's sort of what's, what's happened, right? So I, I played with Chris Boti, who's a big trumpet mm -hmm. artist here in the States and, and, and you know, in, in other places in the world, of course. We met when we were 21. So I've done every kind of gig. I won't go into the gory details, but I've done every bottom of the barrel gig that you could do with that guy, right? And that's what happened. He and I and other people like us, right? We, we met in New York at a very early age and I played weddings and bar mitzvahs, right? I played in bars. Right? I, did, I, I did anything that someone would allow me to participate in, right? Pay me a little money, I'd come do it. And... If you're, if you're powerful, you have something about you that's powerful, you bubble up and, and Chris bubbles up and, you know, call him, call him. And all of a sudden it just, you know, it just goes like that. It keeps rising up. But if you don't go to a place like that, that can't happen. The caveat to that is now there's the internet. So I know in certain cases, people have had success by being wherever and just going on the internet and being mind blowing. Right. So, uh, that, so my, my tale of how you do it is, necessarily the only one like all things right it's about human beings it's about social social relationships social business relationships so you can go somewhere and come to know a lot of people that are similar to you in terms of your power your young power and what you're shooting for that's the best way to do this i could speak for hours with you andy you you impart <laughs> such wisdom that Amy, who asked, who recommended we speak to some cool dude, is exactly right. The angles you come in from are so different from the world in which I and other flute players live in. Sure. That we sure. can learn so much from, and we should be open to learning from other instrumentalists. So it's, it's come to mind uh, from Paul Simon. I know a flute player in New York named Alex Sop, S-O-P-P, who's super powerful. Right. And, and I, I believe went to Juilliard. And so she's in that. 
classical world, and she's super great and amazing. But she also sings, and she also writes music, and she has this kind of like fluid. I don't think she's an improviser per se, right? But but she's got this sort of fluid career that that is definitely in the classical world, right? And the modern classical world, she's definitely super known and important in that. But but it goes other places. So she's the person that did that study as an example, right? But had these other things that she was interested in that she allowed herself to be interested in. So she's having an interesting career, right? Because I would say she's absolutely great as a classical artist, but she's allowing herself to be interested in whatever she's interested in. And, it's, and so she ends up playing with Paul Simon, right? As part of a, a classical, for, for a couple tours, as part of a, a, a modern classical ensemble that he enlisted. Whatever else she's doing, she's doing things outside of the straight classical world that kind of reflect her talents and her interests and what she's allowing herself to be interested in. I think I just took you off course, but anyway, you, you didn't because you didn't because it's impossible to pre-see this podcast because there's so many salient points you've made, and I would recommend people because you've made so many to actually go back and listen to it and actually write notes down because. If we don't, if we just listen and then we don't act, everything just sort of disappears and then we end up moaning, oh, we can't improvise or or there's no opportunities opening up for me. But go back and listen to what Andy's saying. He started in the School of Hard Knocks, as he said. Nothing was given to him on a plate. He's had to work damn hard for this. There's no no overnight success. And look, I position myself to be a competitor, Mm -hmm. right? When I was 15, I practiced the saxophone endlessly. Right? Annoying my family and my neighbors to no end, I'm sure, but everyone was gracious and they let me do it. Right. So by the time I was in my very early twenties, I could legit compete, maybe more than I even realized, right? Because you're insecure when you're young. So I positioned myself to be a competitor. And then I was willing to do whatever. And I had bits of good luck also, right? Which I would never discount. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I, I came to the game with a reasonable personality. And, and, and professionalism, right? People also rate you on those kind of things. Are you showing up on time, right? Are, are you bombed when you show up? Mm. Or are you, are, you, are you sober and ready to go? Oh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a combination of all those things, right? Like making good decisions for yourself, a, a bit of luck, and then, yeah, being willing to do anything when you start. Anything, like nothing should be beneath you, literally. If a combination is correct, if someone is offering you reasonable money to come do a thing, the circus, a bar mitzvah, whatever, nothing should be beneath you because, frankly, you never know who you'll meet. I met Chris Bodie auditioning for the the house cover band at the Playboy Club in New York City. <laughs> they, they, they tried to rebrand the Playboy Club for a couple of years. It failed, but this was in the 80s. But, you know, I'm going to be part of a cover band. It's not beneath me, but it wasn't like, oh, this is some amazing opportunity. But I end up meeting this person who's super important in my whole life, right? And on that note, I'm very aware of the importance of your the time in your day because you are a very, very busy Hector. So I'd like to close with one last question, yes. which, which is, what makes Andy Snitzer happy? <laughs> I saw that one. Uh, um well, I, I mean, the overview is I'm extremely grateful to be sitting here, right, as I am at this point in my life, looking back on, you know, a pretty nice ride, a pretty nice career. That makes me happy. A kid with a dream, and then you pull it off, right? Like you're, you're able in one way or another to pull it off. And yes, there, certainly for everybody, there's things that I'm shooting for that don't come as easily, right? In terms of career aspects, something comes very, some things come very, very well, and I wouldn't say easily, but but nicely. And some things are quite hard. It makes me happy to reflect on the idea that I tried to do this and I was able to do it. Work in music, be part of things that are cool, right? Continue to play my instrument well, right? Not have any physical limitations uh, come forward. That makes me happy, right? Like to 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 be able to participate in this have an outlet for expression that's my own, like I I can make my own records now, all of that. And then, of course, people and family. And But I think if you're asking me from a sort of existential career perspective, I would say being able to to continue to participate at the level that I've been able to get to, that makes me happy. 15 or 16-year-old me would look at this and go, 
No way, man. No way. No way did that happen, right? No way were you on stage and, and, and Mick Jagger is introducing you and saying your name, you know, <laughs> like to the, to the crowd of 70,000 people. No, no way that happened. So... Andy, you've been so very generous with your time today. And may I thank you so much for agreeing to come onto a podcast which has flutes in its title. Well, it's my pleasure. And I, I, I'm going to just say that I'm glad that we didn't discuss my flute playing at all. Because <laughs> that, 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 that's my, and that's, I'll say one more thing about on that. I'm making fun of myself correctly, but, but that's, that's another part of, of the idea of just staying true to what, what's like, hey, what you feel inside of you. JP, I was never, never going to be a good doubler, right? I started on clarinet. So when I was 17 or 18, I was a very good clarinet player. I've kind of let it tail off, but I've got, I still have the fundamentals of good sound on the clarinet and some technique. I am not meant to play the flute. I am certainly not meant to play the oboe. I could have spent all my life and all my practice hours and all my time, right, trying to be that person. And the best I would have done would be would be to be like kind of a you know an average guy in 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 that in that world, right? I was never ever ever going to be great at that, right? Like I know that there's a gentleman named Aaron Hike in New York. I met Aaron in my twenties, right? In his twenties, saxophone, clarinet, flute, and oboe, right? All at really good level. So. That, that opened my eyes me to the idea that, like, look, you just have to go with your strengths, man. You're, if you were going to be that guy, right, at 24, you would be him. But you can't play the oboe. You can't play the flute. You can you play the clarinet, right? Look, look what, look, that's, that's his gift, right? His hard work. But also to be able to do that at 24, play all those instruments at kind of a high level, right, in terms of the doubling world, professional level, that's his road. It's not yours. So forget about that, man. Forget forget about trying to be a doubler. Like keep your clarinet, get a little flute together so when they want you for you on the saxophone and they need a couple little parts on some other instruments, you don't have to say no, right? But but past that, forget about that. And that was the right call. So whatever you feel like is your power, right? As as a as a, a musician and a player. You go with that. Don't don't feel like you've got to do this, right? Because you have to do this. Because oh, you need to get your doubles together. Certainly, if you're not talented that way, if you're not gifted that way, you're never going to compete. Well, yeah. As always, Andy, you're looking in good shape. And uh, <laughs> yeah, thank thank you once again. And I'm up again next week with the latest happiness hypothesis, talking flutes bite size episode. So until then. Wishing you a musically fulfilling week ahead and may your improvisation take you north in direction. However, if you find yourself going south, then simply turn around. Goodbye. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.